This week, we welcome Chris Elge. He's a major at the Massachusetts Army National Guard, and Jim McPherson, cybersecurity analyst, and they will be talking about public utility security and the National Guard's uh, cyber exercises coming up. In our second segment, we welcome back Mr. Mick Douglas. He's the founder and owner of InfoSec Innovations. He will be discussing a new project that he may or may not be launching live on this show tonight called Project Fantastic, bringing the CLI to GUI users. In the security news, Nacon APT hit a five-year espionage attack. Proof of concept exploits are released for denial of service vulnerability in OpenSSL. 900,000 WordPress sites are being attacked via XSS vulnerabilities. Uh, Kaji, a new Linux malware, targets IoT devices in the wild. Another Stuxnet-style vulnerability found in Schneider Electric Software. And remembering the I Love You virus. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Qualys has brought together vulnerability management and patch management, letting security teams discover vulnerabilities and apply patches immediately, all within a single unified app. Sign up for a free trial of Qualys VMDR, vulnerability management, detection, and response today at securityweekly.com forward slash Qualys. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. And welcome to the show. But first, let me introduce you to a man who, when he makes a mess, tosses you a towel. Mr. Paul Asadori. Welcome to Paul Security Weekly. It's episode number 650, recorded on May 7th, 2020. I am here in G Unit, <coughs> excuse me, studios in Rhode Island on the lines remotely. Some of the regular cast and crew, Mr. Larry Pesci, is here with us remotely. Indeed, indeed, I am. You know, in the in the home <coughs> office with all sorts of fun projects. Yes, because uh, according to Rhode Island uh, regulations, as of tomorrow, if you and I were to be in the same office space, we would both have to be wearing masks. Yes, which makes yes, it hard it for me to smoke cigars and drink, and difficult for you to drink, unless we cut holes in our mask. But I think that defeats the purpose. It's a purpose. It does. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. No. So what? As of Saturday, we can have five people in a group, but we have to be wearing masks. Uh, I, it's it's so there needs to be a like a maintenance. We need a. That's five. We need a, a PowerPoint and a, a, a matrix and all kinds of stuff to figure out what yeah. should uh, I be wearing a mask. Is Regardless it, of what it looks like you know, for us, really not much has changed. No. Except that we can now get mixed drinks takeout. Yes. <laughs> Which is awesome. I think some of these rules should, that have changed should stay changed. Uh, like Agreed. the ability to get uh, booze uh, via takeout. Mr. Tyler Robinson is here with us remotely. Yes, Tyler, welcome. Tyler, welcome. Buenos dias. Tyler, you're at, to be Tyler here. you're at 5%. You're at 5%. There's, an There's an echo. But uh, I know five percent again. It's not. It's not, not good. It's not, it's not going up. Not going up. That sounds like a personal <laughs> problem. Mr. Jeff Mann is here with us. Jeff, welcome. Greetings, as always, Paul. I have to ask, uh, and I hesitate to bring it up because it will defeat the scientific experiment. But how many weeks in a row is that beer bottle going to sit on that table next to you? It's actually a different beer every week. It's funny you say yeah, that. I swear that's the exact same bottle that was there last week. There is no one I mean, it else. It might be the same brand. Yes, no one else is drinking, and I think there might have been a six-pack of these, and so every okay. week I, I open up a new one. So it's, I in mean, fact, okay. fresh beer. All right, let me see. It's new. Take a drink. It is. And don't it's, it's make it new. It's still cold. <laughs> mm. All right. Mm. It's just like Wait. we came online, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, that bottle was there last week. Very okay, observant good. of you, Jeff. Mr. Yes, Lee Neely is here with us. Lee, welcome. Ah, good to be here. We're 
holding down the fort here, enjoying the later evening light. It won't get dark here till almost nine o'clock. And uh, looking forward to a fun show. And uh, don't forget that new picnic set. It comes with 25 pieces, one chair, and a 24 pack of beer. Nice. Very nice. Uh, let's see a couple of announcements to get us started. Oh, Joff. I can't see Joff. Where is Joff? He's somewhere. I'm right here. <laughs> he's, he's right there. No, wait. That's not Joff. That's, that's Tyler. That's Tyler. <laughs> I see Joff's icon in the corner of Tyler's screen over the battery. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very technically challenged show this week. Well, Tyler will There's be some gone kind momentarily, of and then Joff will fill in. Joff is definitely here with there he is. How do? I, hey, it's good to be here. I haven't seen you in a couple of weeks, and I've been missing everybody, so I'm back. No more missing everybody. That's yes. wonderful. Good to have you, Joff. Uh, you. We, we are looking for high-quality guest suggestions for all of our podcasts to fill up our schedule. And why not fill them with people that you would like to see on the show? Securityweekly.com forward slash guests is the place where you can go make your guest suggestions. Uh, Chris Elge is here with us. He is a core Net Wars tournament design lead and penetration tester. He does hacking challenges and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, and is also uh, in the National Guard uh, and involved with their cyber exercises as well. Chris, welcome. Thanks, Paul. Glad to be back on. Yes, nice to have you, Chris. Uh, Jim McPherson is here with us. He is a cybersecurity expert with over 15 years of experience and is also involved in the same cyber exercises with Chris. Jim, welcome. How are you doing? I'm glad to be here. Doing fantastic. I have uh, booze and cigars and wonderful guests and hosts to kick off the show. Um, so uh, let's talk about um, the – set the stage for us and talk about the uh, cyber exercise uh, that you are both involved in. Yeah, so every year we do this exercise called Cyber Yankee, and it's a kind of a, a fun little regional thing that we do between the National Guard and different uh, civilian stakeholders, uh, people like Jim involved in, in, in the utility sector – and it lets us um, do a couple of things. Like one, it lets us kind of practice some of our cyber capabilities, but also it lets us build some of the relationships that are really the important piece uh, that we would need going into any any actual disaster where where the government is supporting uh, any kind of private en entity or critical infrastructure. There are a lot of CTFs out there, as I'm noticing. <laughs> Capture the flag exercises, cyber exercises, cyber ranges, uh, cyber labs. Um, what what makes this event uh, different and and special in its own unique way? I think I'll, I'll throw it to Jim in just a second. But I think for me, what makes it different is is for one, it's it's an actual red on blue thing where where usually I'm in the in the red cell with some you know maybe a couple dozen operators and we're we're attacking this virtual range that that people like Jim are, are watching and, and defending. Um, that's a big piece of it. And the, and the other piece is just is just that there are so many different uh, people in the room where a lot of times CTFs. You know, you got your little teams here and there, but people don't have to work together like they do in something like this. Uh, what, do you, what do you think, Jim? Yeah, um, so I really, I'm not a big, um, you know, CTF blue, um, like red team guy. I've always been more of the the blue team stuff. And, and I think this brings this di a different aspect where you've got, um, you know, your your regular, you know, red team cell trying to hack into... Um, you know, the, the blue team's computers, which are being defended by actual people. Um, however, this brings into account some other things like um, the industry partners, which we play in, 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 a, in this exercise, Cyber Yankee. So we try and bring some realism as if you're going to come to a business, you know, um, there isn't like, a, you know, we still have regulations that you have to man maintain. We still have change management that has to be um, take into account for, you know, we still have management that has to be informed. So we make sure that those channels stay open, communicating with the people trying to defend the organization, forcing them to explain to us what's being attacked, how it's being attacked, why is that bad for us? Um, we also then, you know, play onto them certain things like these things have to be maintained. Regardless of what it is, you've got to keep this up. You know, say, for example, somebody gets attacked and they get into your VPN. Well, VPN is critical. We say fix it, you know, secure it, but that has to stay up. You know, the website has to stay up. We have core business functions that have to be there. Um, so it just kind of brings a different aspect to your normal CTF challenge. 
It sounds very similar to uh, the CCDC competitions that take place in the various regions. Yeah, it has a lot of the same pieces, absolutely. Are there, are there differences? I mean, other than the people playing are older than college student <laughs> age? <laughs> I, I mean, on a technical aspect, I don't, I don't think they're, they're that terribly different. I haven't been personally involved in CCDC, but I have some friends uh, who have been. Um, I, again, I think it's going to be that, you know, with CCDC or with like a Net Wars tournament, you know, you get your own teams that you get to put together. Uh, but with this, we, we bring others uh, into the room and you've got to kind of meet people and, and uh, you know, shake hands. Or I guess, you know, distance high five maybe this year. Mm. Oh, I had a question. Go ahead, Lee. How, how, how are you determining who's red and who's blue? That's a great question. So the default for everybody is is blue, right? Like we want to have, if we have, you know, say the New Hampshire National Guards, um, you know, um, computer, uh, computer team come, like they're by default going to be a blue team. Uh, but if they maybe don't have enough people or they have some extra people, then overflow usually ends up in red. Uh, or sometimes we'll get people from, from the outside. Like this year, I think we're getting some people out of the Marine Corps Reserve to do uh, the red cell functions for us. But, um, you know, there aren't many people in the military, especially in the National Guard, whose job it is to do something offensive. Um, so so whenever we can train blue, we, we try to default to that. And is it, is it mostly National Guard folks that are attending? Like, what, what are the various uh, kind of groups that would participate in this type of event? Yeah, gosh, it's probably maybe 60% Air and Army National Guard. And then we get a few, you know, maybe Navy Reserve, Marine Corps Reserve, something like that. Uh, and then a good chunk of civilians. We had people from um, Portsmouth Naval Shipyard last year, people like people like Jim, uh, and a lot of civilian law enforcement. We actually had um, one of the intel guys like get arrested by a you know a state trooper or something in the middle of an exercise because you know he was he was oh. physically playing the bad guy. Mm. But but it's a great uh, you know I think situation because it's not uh, when we do this in CCDC uh, oftentimes right in similar kinds of exercises. It's usually that you're defending uh, some type of corporate entity, right? But in, in this case, when it's law enforcement in maybe collaboration with the National Guard, you're likely defending all different types of infrastructure. And I just don't mean critical infrastructure in the terms of like uh, ICS, power plants, right? I mean, all different types of infrastructure, such as as we go through this crisis, right? We may have stood up a temporary hospital uh, and laid the groundwork for communications networks, and those need to be defended. And now we have to collaborate with brand new people, right? And I, I think that's really, if I were to look at this type of exercise and mimicking those style events, that's the most difficult thing, <laughs> is being able to communicate about a security incident, let's say, with brand new people from all different backgrounds. That's true. I think, I know they've, they've tried to get... Um more sectors involved mm -hmm. um and i thought there was supposed to be some last year but i don't think that happened i think they were trying to get in i think one of the hospitals from new hampshire i believe um it's t i mean it's tough like anything right i mean uh, we're not the national guard doesn't pay um the private sector to come and participate mm. um you know so it's it's got to be it's a lot of volunteer work um and you have to get a lot of backing from your organization, which, you know, that's going to be hit and miss again, because it's their money that's paying for things, not the National Guard. Um, so your benefits, especially on the private side, are, are more intangible things than they are, you know, monetary, um, which I think that's why we stay involved in this is because we it's, it's good to know somebody like Chris, um, you know, and, uh, you know, some of the Massachusetts National Guard agencies, um, National Guard um, units, same thing with like the Connecticut National Guard. Um, it's good to have these relationships because, you know, like those are the things that money can't buy in times of chaos is being able to know those people, put a face to a name um, and, you know, know who you're talking to and working with. Mm. Yeah. And like you say, there's it's, it's not always easy for organizations to send people, for civilian organizations to send people because you're not in the in the training mode. Like when we, like we in the National Guard or in, in the military as a whole, you know, we, we train and train for months and years and then go deploy for, you know, maybe a month for coronavirus or, or a year to, you know, the desert or something. But we, we're always in that training mode. So for us showing up to an exercise to practice for right. a couple of weeks is like totally on par. But like in most parts of the industry, mm. you spend 
50 weeks out of the year producing and doing operations. And maybe you get a couple of weeks if you're lucky to do either go to go take a class or participate in something like this. How would how would uh, some of the private sector or industry people get involved with something like this without knowing like connections with inside the military or even knowing these operations are going on? Like that's kind of very, very interesting to several things that we're working on. Um, but how would uh, how would people find information or what's kind of the, the streamline of, of disseminating that information? You know, that's a, that's a solid question. And I, I think the answer is word of mouth. <laughs> and maybe that's why uh, we don't have more participation. But yeah, if you're at all interested, by all means, Tyler, I'd love to have you. Yeah, no, that's, oh, you know, that's the way we try and get a lot of people involved um, on our side. Um, you know, we like the event. Um, you know, it's, it's good training. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of things that, uh, um, you just can't train for in a tabletop exercise or, you know, it's, it's really tough for any private organization to put on something like cyber Yankee. Let me, let you know, let's face it, you know, the, the U S government spends tons of money in the military. So the government has the money. Um, so if we can get into something like this and reap some benefits of government money, um, you know, we try and provide, obviously, our, you know, uh, you know, industry partner relevance to them. But, um, you know, it's I, it's I, I do think it would be difficult to find out about it. But we try and keep people that we work with close, you know, try and get them engaged and involved because we like the we like Cyber Yankee. So we want Cyber Yankee to stay around. So, I mean, we try and get people involved where we can. <laughs> With that kind of, how do uh, how do vendors and or like scenarios get kind of played out and planned out? Is that something that happens yearly? Is that something that happens through like a committee, like getting some of the ICS vendors, or maybe uh, you're doing something around hospitals? Like there's a lot of places that I think uh, many of us have good connections in for good scenarios. But how do you guys like go about deciding those particular scenarios and planning these events? Yeah, we have meetings before our meetings. Uh, we, we have like a <laughs> exercise design conference and then initial mid and final planning conferences. And, and, and we bring a few things in, into, uh, into consideration. One is, is who we think is going to come play and what kind of things, what kind of tasks they may want to train on. Uh, and then, uh, you know, of course, we, we need to have uh, valid training value for the military units. That's how, that's how the money comes is this is, this is you know, National Guard training dollars. So uh, it's, it's basically a, a, a shared discussion with all the stakeholders and what they want to learn while, while we're together. Cool. Oh, I, go ahead, Lee. Sorry, Tyler. Go ahead. No, that was oh. me. Go ahead, Lee. Okay. What well, I was just going to ask, what for each of you is your favorite part of the event? And a second part of the question is, how is it for you getting enough time to do what you want to do at the event? You want to go first? Sure. So my favorite thing is is probably. Uh, probably shenanigans. <laughs> I'd like to tell you that it's, you know, it's the training, but it, it's just, it's just so nice to get together with, with like-minded people. Cause I mean, anybody who listens to the show, like we're, we're a certain subset of, of society, right? So when we're, at, when we're at, we're at this thing and DOT drops off, like one of those road signs and say, Hey, you can hack this. Like we're going to get together and like, you know, adult beverages and lock picks and get into it and hack it. And then we're going to go the next night and go do an escape room or something. So I think it's, I think it's my favorite part is just, is just getting together and, and doing the fun nerdy things uh, that we like to do. Um, and as, as far as time, um, I mean, it ends up being a couple of weeks. So usually everything we want to get in, uh, we get in. Jim? Yeah, so I'd have to say it's um, it's the intangibles. I, I, de I definitely don't go and, you know, sit behind the computer and try and do, um, you know, like IDS work, sim work, that kind of thing. Um, try and help where I can with somebody that's, you know, lacking. Um, and I think that that's, you know, enjoyable being able to train more and it's 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 a good skill to you know maintain um i think it's the other things um realizing how important lines of communication are understanding um you know what the problem is how do you communicate that to somebody um how do they communicate the problem to you you know how do you communicate that to say someone playing your CISO? um i think even last year we were able to get some other outside cyber you know, people involved more like external affairs type people, um, legal type people, you know, so how do you, 
how do you discuss these things with them um, in, you know, the most real world scenario that we have? I think it just goes to show you, you know, how important, you know, people to people communication really is, even in, you know, a computer world. And when we're talking about, you know, breaches and cyber intrusion and, you know, all this kind of thing. What, what various components uh, are in play this year? <clears throat> I know that uh, Larry and I spent several years involved with CCDC, and it was interesting to see which components would be in play. Because, I mean, yes, there was Windows computers. Yes, there was Linux computers. But sometimes there was SCADA. Sometimes there was purpose-built devices. Sometimes there was Wi-Fi. Or uh, the one year, Larry, that you built the whole uh, RFID uh, system, right? So, uh, what, what components are, are in play this year? You know, like you said, a lot of Windows and, and Linux and stuff that gets built out by you know Ansible, Puppet, whatever. Uh, but then we also have these these like SCADA trainers that that look and act a lot like SCADA devices. Of course, they're just like you know Win Seven computers with a with a touch screen, but um, but they've got all the dials and knobs and and, and alarms. Um, in fact, we had some VIPs coming through uh, one time and. And one of the alarms went off on the skater box while they're like trying to get their briefing. So that was, that was kind of a bit of fun realism there. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, what, what other groups uh, are either portrayed by actors, right? Or actually there, uh, they would have to communicate. Can you give me like a, a, a scenario? Yeah. So, you know, we, we might have something where, um, you know, we'll have maybe we'll have each blue team. They'll they'll have like a fictional um, uh, organization they're defending. Like uh, we'll call it, you know, Yankee Power or Yankee Water or whatever. And then uh, and then in that room, they've got somebody like like Jim acting as the network owner because you know we the National Guard don't take over your network in an emergency. We're we're guests there, so whenever we want to do things, we have to clear through them. So, so let's say one of our analysts finds something, uh, then you know the group will discuss it, vet it out. Uh, and then maybe recommend an action to to somebody like Jim, and then he's gonna you know make a decision about whether or not he wants to to shut that firewall port, or if his you know CEO still needs to access that that way. Um, and then uh, if we get to a point where um, you know where the team thinks that they can actually attribute this to somebody, and they've got the the breadcrumbs to follow back, then they can actually call uh, the state police, and and then they'll get involved, and we have FBI partners there, and maybe they'll they'll share share some of this you know fictional analysis, fictional intelligence about about the whole thing and then and then activate from top to bottom from the federal down to the the local level um the whole law enforcement chain and then you know do a do an arrest or do an array do a raid whether that's whether that's notional or actually you know the one time we we put the uh the intel chief in cuffs um this is adorable like 55 year old guy <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah we can use all, all kinds of different pieces together and, and exercise those those uh those channels of communication yeah i think the uh the mock arrests are some of the more uh kind of sensational things that happen uh, that are really fun uh, in those in those events. Uh, we've done similar stuff at, at CCDC. Um, what? How, how do we get uh, commercial security vendors involved? Um, you know, I, I I have a lot of relationships with a lot of security vendors. Obviously, we work with several of them here at Security Weekly, and oftentimes there will be uh, local, state, uh, government, or I mean, basically community resources, right? Uh, whether it's uh, a water plant or whether it's, you know, some a nonprofit that is making available some service on the web uh, that that is part of the, the offerings in the state. You know, like we have, uh, I think it's Health Source RI, right, in Rhode Island, just as, not that they were, well, just as an example, right? So there's lots of different pieces of infrastructure that based on the climate could be attacked in various different ways at the time. And these, a lot of the nonprofits and state and local governments may not have even just the connections or the resources to be able to defend those resources, uh, those, uh, defend themselves from those attacks. There are commercial vendors that would be willing to help, right? Either free or discounted uh, products is, is kind of what, I, what I'm hearing with this latest crisis, right? And we've seen examples of that. Uh, how do we um, bridge that gap and, and like basically play matchmaker? <coughs> Uh, between these two groups yeah i mean as far as bringing them to the exercise like that's that's relatively easy if they if they hear about it and they talk to us and they've got the the manpower to spare for you know a week or two then uh then in in most cases we're happy to bring them in um as as far as like assistance on the outside like we have uh there are some mechanisms where the, the national guard can go out and like do a security assessment for a town 
Uh, but it's it's like legally it's new territory and the lawyers, the Jags are still kind of like weird about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are mechanisms for us to do that. But like you say, there are a lot of private vendors around and we can't we can't compete with, you know, local security vendor. Uh, we, we can't try to like undercut them by, hey, we're going to come in for free and then take the business away from somebody else. So it gets kind of tricky for us to do that kind of outside of emergency uh, support. So that's why, you know, our default is usually these types of exercises, because this is something that's, that's easy to do. It's not something that someone's going to say, hey, you know, I was going to offer a contract to local water company to, uh, to run an exercise. Right? That's, just, that, that's just not a thing. So What about commercial, um, sense, like, um, commercial defensive products, right? Like someone's under attack in some certain way. I mean, there's a list of vendors that could help with that product, uh, that uh, problem, right? Uh, and, you know, maybe there's some kind of matrix or something that we build to, to help make those connections, right? Yeah, maybe so. And I'm not, I'm not sure that that's something the, uh, the military needs to have a role in. Well, if they can come to the exercise, right, make those connections, I guess it's kind of a call to the commercial vendors if you're willing to have them, right? Because this is something that I think CCDC was very, uh, very much wanted to regulate, um, you know, putting commercial products in play, right? We get into this type of scenario, if a commercial product can help, um, I think it can add an interesting aspect, um, cause it, I mean, there's no rules in hacking, right? <laughs> so if something's out there, they can help you defend what well, we should, uh, be able to enable that. Right. And I think that's really just communication. Um, so how, how, how long is the event? I mean, it sounds like it's a couple of weeks and, you know, like a huge group of people in there. Yep. A couple of weeks and two, 300 people. Yep. Holy crap. That's cool. <laughs> Yes, but in some of its training, like the first few days are just, you know, we'll, we'll put classes together and gotcha. uh, maybe we'll walk through like miter attack or something. And then uh, there'll be a solid like week of actually, you know, people behind keyboards and, and red on blue action. That's awesome. I like the way Chris said that red on blue action. <laughs> some action, some penetrating. Yes. <laughs> Penetration will happen. Um, what what are some of your uh, most favorite kind of uh, like injects right on on either side because uh, these were and you touched on some of those in the beginning right and these are interesting uh, kind of real world uh, type scenarios that happen uh, you know in other words you one of your communication mechanisms may go down or you know the red team could be hacking but Maybe there's a power outage, right, on top of someone, you know, breaking into your systems, right? What are some of your favorite ones that you you have built in in the past? I don't know if you want to take a crack of that. Um, okay. You know what? Um, this was actually the first year I was going to be involved in some of the more uh, some of the planning conferences, but they generally do those. Um, they generally are split, so. You know, if you're white cell, when you go to the the conference, you go to white cell. If you're blue cell, you go to blue cell. If you're red cell, you go to red cell. Um, I could say that some of my more favorite injects are the ones where the red team isn't successful. So they like uh, inject a fire alarm and make everybody go out so they can (laughs) uh, plant malware or, um, you know, all those last minute ones. Um, uh, Or I think... And I think that one was because somebody messed up uh, the firewall configuration or something like that. So they had to get back in and reset everything. So they forced everybody out of the building so they could reset firewalls, bring everybody back in. And then all of a sudden, 50 users clicked on uh, Meterpreter malware or whatever, and all the boxes were owned. (laughs) I think those are the good ones. (laughs) Yeah. And a lot of times, like, Blue will knock themselves offline, right? They'll, They'll be trying to configure their own firewall, and they'll they'll lock themselves out completely. And then... You know, they're they're calling in like, oh, you know, we got we got hose, we got taken offline, we can't play anymore, and we're like, we didn't we didn't do anything. <laughs> awesome. So, how do people get involved uh, with this with this event? Are you open to the public getting involved, or various people, or getting more exposure, or if you want to tell our friends uh, that are either you know on the red or the blue or government or infrastructure or whatever, like, how do people get involved? Yeah, honestly, just uh, just reach out. They can reach out to me or, or to uh, other people in the uh, uh, involved in the exercise, and we can we can uh, loop you in if you're the right uh, if you're the right person. I, I'm you know you're talking about uh, security vendors. I, I'm not sure how that works out. If that comes off as kind of like you know commercially selly, then then the Jags might get all all upset again. But 
Um, but yeah, if, if somebody's working for a local town, for a utility, for, for anybody where it makes sense, right? Who people who we would be working with in a in an emergency, uh, then there's there's room. So just yeah, reach out and we'll we'll have the talk. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, Chris and Jim, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. It's nice having you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And without taking a short break, come back with Mick Douglas to learn about turning the CLI into a GUI.